Yvonne Ford was a 33-year-old woman with a mild intellectual disability who lived in New South Wales town of Wagga Wagga. Now, despite her disability, she was able to live independently and was known as a great employee at the local boarding kennels where she walked the dogs five hours a day during the week. She loved the dogs. She'd drawn up a chart to remind herself which dogs had been walked and which had not. She even had a dog of her own that she adored. Getting to the kennels was another thing, though. Luckily, in Wagga, there's a community transport service that was available to drive her to and from work, which was a community-based organisation that employed volunteer drivers, which were mostly retired people or others just trying to keep busy or get something to add to their resume. Yvonne was very security conscious. She didn't let anyone into the house that she didn't know very well. She was happy to let the Woolworths delivery guy come in with her shopping or the community transport drivers to help her with her stuff. She knew them all. All Yvonne wanted in life was a car, a boyfriend and a family. It's not really much more to ask, really. Yvonne was totally harmless and everyone who met her loved her. On the 17th of October 1998, she heard a knock on the door. Hi, Yvonne. It's Matthew from Community Transport. Yvonne knew Matthew. He was nice. Ah, oh, Matthew, what are you doing here? She said to him. He just said he'd come to see her and have a bit of a chat. So Yvonne let him in and they engaged in a little bit of small talk in the lounge. Yvonne was happy to see him. She didn't get too many visitors and her and Matthew had had a few good talks in the past. After a little bit of time, Matthew started hitting on Yvonne. I mean, he made sexual advances towards her. He offered to rub her back in the bath. They went to the bathroom and Yvonne got in and Matthew took off his clothes and sat in the bath behind her. He then grabbed her around the neck and began to choke and strangle her. Yvonne struggled, moving to and fro and splashing about everywhere. So Matt, with all of his strength, grabbed her head and he held her under the water until everything went quiet. Let's take a stab at this. Hi mates and welcome to Something About Murder. I'm Jay Something and every week we present for your satisfaction two episodes in true crime from here in Australia. If that sounds interesting to you, go ahead and shoot the like button with your trusty boomstick and stab that subscribe button until it starts to leak all over your lovely floorboards, pulling in an area just under the couch so you can't see if you've cleaned it all up before the cops come. Make sure you also punch the notification bell in the face so that you can get notified every time we release a new video. Our videos are also available in audio form on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or whichever podcast platform is your favourite. Wagga Wagga, in the 90s, was a sleepy regional city of New South Wales. It's considered to be a home for sport in this country, with many Australian sporting heroes coming from the area, including former Australian Test cricket captain Mark Taylor and rugby legend Peter Sterling. It's also an educational hub, with the famous Charles Sturt University in its midst. Famous Australian snack Chico Rolls were also invented in Wagga Wagga. With that kind of history, it should come as no surprise that the people of Wagga Wagga were outraged and angry when the stories of the murders by Matthew James Harris began to be released in the media. Matthew James Harris was born on the 30th of June 1968. He was adopted at the age of about 10 months and grew up in Cronulla. His adoptive parents had been told they could not have any children and put arrangements in place to adopt Matthew. However, four months before Matthew was born, they had a little girl. After Matthew had been adopted, his mother also gave birth to a son. Matthew found as a young child that he was treated differently by his parents, especially his mother, and he couldn't work out why. He began having regular nightmares that his adoptive mother was trying to kill him seeing her silhouetted by the window brandishing a knife. The mystery of why he felt so different from the other kids was solved in 1978 when Matthew was 10 years old. He was told by his parents that he had been adopted. This discovery disturbed him emotionally and he began to exhibit serious behavioural problems, fantasising about killing people from around the age of 13. He began abusing alcohol and skipping school. His parents, already emotionally removed from the one child in their house that wasn't theirs, couldn't give a shit, and tried to get Matthew fostered somewhere else. The Department of Community Services arranged various placements for Matthew over the years. A report by the district officer, dated the 12th of July 1983, was prepared two weeks after Matthew's 15th birthday, 
At the time, Matthew was in temporary foster care with a family in Gymea. His behaviour with this foster family had been observed to be quite good. It was noted that his parents had shown a complete lack of interest in him. His adoptive parents lived 10 minutes by car from the foster home, but made no attempts to contact Matthew. After several failed attempts to settle in with foster parents, Matthew ran away from home at the age of 15 to live on the streets. He jumped from refuge to refuge and slept under bridges. It was at this time that Matthew became a male prostitute and began using heroin. Matthew's murder fantasies persisted, telling psychologists later that he always thought he wanted to kill his mother and the rest of his family. He was angry at the world that he was adopted and angry that he was then rejected by his adopted parents. He also hated the fact that he had to prostitute himself in order to live his life. He harboured murderous thoughts about his clients, saying that he went with so many blokes that he wanted to kill but didn't. In January 1991, he was charged with offences of armed robbery and assault on one of his customers. In May 1991, he was sentenced to a minimum prison term of two and a half years, with an additional term of six months for the assault. While serving this sentence, the social worker at the Juni prison put Matthew in touch with Elaine de Jong. Both Elaine de Jong and her daughter Jane were active in the Triangle Organisation, a voluntary group which aims to assist adoptees to meet their biological parents. Elaine agreed to assist Matthew in locating his mother, and they found her and organised a meeting, which only lasted three or four minutes. His mother explained that she'd given him up at birth, and that she did not want any further contact with him. He was given to understand that his mother had given birth to him at an early age and that she'd since had another family uh, with children who she said represented her own family. Those children knew nothing of Matthew, nor did she wish them to learn of him. Once again, Matthew had been rejected and this was a crushing blow. Elaine and Matthew's platonic friendship deepened and following his release from custody in November 1993, he moved to Wagga Wagga. He was 25 years old and was motivated by a desire to make a fresh start away from the life that he'd known in King's Cross in the previous decade. Elaine and her family took Matthew in and attempted to wean him off heroin. Matthew travelled up to Sydney occasionally to buy heroin. He was arrested and charged with stealing and fined $200. In 1994, he undertook a basic education course at the Wagga Wagga TAFE. This course lasted for six months. Matthew found the content of it too simple to be of real interest. However, he persisted because it provided him with something to do and he really wanted to please Elaine and her family. And so after six or seven months of living with Elaine, he was admitted to a residential rehabilitation program and eventually moved into his own apartment. Elaine maintained daily contact with him and they continued to develop a deep friendship. Matthew got a job for a short time at Cargill's Meatworks as a packer. He didn't undertake paid employment very often and uh, got fired quite quickly, but he did do voluntary work as a driver with a community transport service, an organisation which provided transport for elderly and disabled persons in Wagga Wagga. However, approaching 30 years old, he became overwhelmed with depression, feeling he was doing nothing worthwhile with his life. At the time, he was associating with a guy called Ken Fraser. He was a career crim with a lengthy record, particularly involving sexual assaults and other violent offences. Not a nice cat. On the 19th of June 1998, Matthew and Ken were drinking and had run out of booze. Neither of them had money to buy alcohol. Ken said that they should go and rob someone, and Matthew said that he didn't want to be involved in any of that. The next night, once again the two couldn't get any booze and had no money, about 7.15pm on the Saturday night. Once again, Ken said they should rob someone. What about that armed robbery? And this time Matthew said, why not? Both men put on their baseball caps, armed themselves with large kitchen knives, and went to the front door of a unit in Nordlingen Drive, Wagga Wagga. These units were situated directly behind the block of units in which they both lived in Joy's place. They knocked on the front door of the unit saying, Open up! It's the police! Vietnamese immigrant Trang Nguyen opened the front door of the unit and the two men pushed their way in. She tried to stop them coming in, but they easily just pushed her aside. They held a knife to Trang's throat as she cowered on the couch with her three children and they demanded money. Fearing for the safety of her children, she took $55 from her purse and gave it to Matthew. They then held their knives to her throat again and asked for a bank card and her PIN number, which she didn't have. They insisted that she give them more money and she said, I've only got coins. And they said, fine, that's fine, whatever. And she gave them $3 in coins, huge amount. Ken then searched the flat, but didn't find anything worth taking, and Matthew told Ken to cut the telephone line. 
after trying a couple of times to do that with his knife, Ken gave up and he pulled it out of the wall and the two men just left the property. And as they left, Ken pushed his knife through the fly screen at the front door and told Trang Nguyen not to call the police. Ken and Matthew then ran into the night, spending the pitiful takings of $58 on cheap booze. After this robbery was reported to police, both men were asked to attend an identification parade at the Wagga Wagga police station. There was insufficient evidence to charge either of them at that time, and Trang Nguyen was too scared to identify them properly. After getting away with the robbery of Trang Nguyen, Matthew felt emboldened, especially after he'd been drinking. It was around this time that Matthew Harris began reading true crime books. He was particularly interested in the Ivan Milat case, later saying that it sparked off something in him. On the 1st of October 1998, drunken Matthew knocked on Peter Winnerbaum's door. Peter was 62 years old and was Elaine de Jong's brother. He lived near Matthew, so Matthew had been there a few times with Elaine in the past and had known him to keep large sums of money in the house. It was later reported that Peter would sometimes have between $600 to $800 hidden in places around the house. Matthew asked Peter for a glass of water, and Peter, being suspicious of this person he'd only met a couple of times, brought him a glass to the door. Matthew barged his way in, and as Peter tried to remonstrate with him and, and get him out of his house, Matthew strangled him. It's unclear whether Matthew tried to rob Peter and killed him instead, or whether he just wanted to straight up murder the 62-year-old man. Either way, Peter didn't put up much of a fight. He'd suffered a stroke in recent times, and Matthew just squeezed, squeezed, squeezed until he was dead. Four days later, Jeffrey Hall was on his way to visit his son in Jack Avenue. Peter Wennerbaum lived next door. Jeffrey noticed that Peter's front door was open, and the TV was on, and walked in to check on him. He found the elderly man lying on the floor, and immediately called an ambulance. Senior Constable Joseph Christie responded to the call that was placed by the ambulance officers once they attended the scene. On inspecting the body, he noticed a bruise on the side of the deceased's throat, which he regarded as suspicious. Pathologist Paul Bottrell conducted an autopsy four days later, on the 8th of October 1998, and gave the cause of death as consistent with strangulation. Elaine de Jong was absolutely devastated on hearing about her brother's death. Elaine's daughter Jane Pope asked Matthew to help her clean out Peter Winnerbaum's unit following the discovery of his body, which he did. Matthew accompanied Elaine and Jane to the funeral, although he didn't enter the church, preferring to stay outside, playing with the children. He also appeared to be quite depressed on the day and in the period after Peter's death. Yvonne Ford was a 33-year-old woman with a mild intellectual disability. Despite her disability, she was able to live independently and was known as a great employee at the local boarding kennels where she walked the dogs five hours a day during the week. She loved the dogs and she'd drawn up a chart to remind herself which dogs had been walked and which ones had not. She even had a dog of her own that she adored. Getting to the kennels was another thing though. Luckily, in Wagga, there was the community transport service that was available to drive her to and from work. Yvonne was very security conscious. She didn't let anyone into the house that she didn't know very well. She was happy to see the Woolworths delivery guy and let him in with her shopping, or the community transport drivers to help her with her stuff. She knew them all. And all Yvonne wanted in life was a car, a boyfriend, and a family. She was totally harmless, and everyone who met her loved her. She enriched their lives. On the 17th of October 1998, she heard a knock on the door of her house at 26 Phillip Avenue. Hi Vaughn, it's Matthew from Community Transport. Matthew had been out on one of his walks and was drunk. Yvonne knew Matthew. He was nice to her on the bus. He said that he'd come to see her and have a chat. Yvonne let him in and they engaged in small talk in the lounge. Yvonne was happy to see him. She didn't get too many visitors and she and Matthew had a few good talks in the past. After a little time, Matthew started hitting on Yvonne, making sexual advances towards her and offered to rub her back in the bath. They went to the bathroom and Yvonne got in and Matthew took off his clothes and sat in the bath behind her. He then grabbed her around the neck and began to choke and strangle her. Yvonne struggled, moving to and fro and splashing about. So Matthew, with all of his strength, grabbed her head and held her under the water until everything went quiet. Matthew later said that he picked her as an easy target due to her disability and when he went home, he felt horrible about what had happened. At 9.15am on the 17th of October, Janice Lowing arrived at Yvonne Ford's home with the intention of driving Yvonne to the boarding kennels, where she worked. Janice knocked on the front door, but nobody answered. She was a little concerned, but she had other people to pick up and drive around, so she left. And as soon as she could, around 11am, she returned to Yvonne's house and knocked again. 
This time, she heard Yvonne's dog inside the building. It was barking, but again, she failed to get any other response. No response from Yvonne, no one came to the door, nothing like that. So Janice then went to Wagga Wagga Police Station and she reported her concerns. When Senior Constable Christopher Jason Hall responded to the report, he also got no response at Yvonne's house. Fearing the worst, he prepared to break into the house. It was unlocked. And he found Yvonne naked in the bath, dead, aged 33 years old. Senior Constable Hall made contact with his supervisor and arranged for forensic police to attend. A post-mortem examination was carried out, but the cause of death was not evident at that time. There was nothing to suggest to the police that the death of Yvonne was the result of foul play. Therefore, there was no mention of Yvonne's death in the paper, and no suspicion. Matthew Harris felt that he'd gotten away with it. Matthew had come to know a number of the other residents of his little block of flats at One Joy's Place over the years. His immediate neighbour at Flat 9 was a 53-year-old man named Ronald Galvin. Ronald was another slightly disabled man who was unable to work. Ronald was a loving man who assisted his parents in a variety of ways which enabled them to enjoy a full and outgoing life in their later years. He would collect them and take them shopping or on visits to the doctor or to see family and friends. Matthew and Ronald obviously knew each other being next door neighbours and Ronald had never done anything to upset Matthew. On the 3rd of November 1998, he knocked on Ronald's door to bum a cigarette and was invited in for a beer. Once inside, Matthew stood behind Ronald, put him on his knees and strangled him again, saying later that Ronald was just a short man who didn't put up any kind of fight. On the 4th of November 1998, Matthew knocked on his good friend Elaine de Jong's door and asked to borrow a car. He carried Mr Galvin's body from the Joy's Place premises wrapped in a doona and put him in the back seat of Elaine's car before driving to an area of tall grass not far from Urin Quinty, where he dumped the body. He was generally familiar with the Urin Quinty area because Elaine's daughter Jane Pope and her family lived there, and he'd stayed at the Pope's home some years earlier. On the 9th of November, Matthew travelled to Sydney, scored heroin, and overdosed in an attempt to kill himself. On Wednesday the 11th of November 1998, Elaine de Jong spoke with Matthew, who told her that he had just returned from a trip to Sydney after taking an overdose. She asked why, and he said that he didn't feel well and he'd talk to her tomorrow. He added that he needed to tell her something. The following day, Elaine went to Matthew's flat, but he was not at home. She made a few phone calls to his friends and learned that Matthew had returned to Sydney. Such was her concern that she flew to Sydney that same day in an attempt to locate him. She returned to Wagga Wagga three days later without having seen Matthew at all. Ronald's father, Cecil Galvin, last saw his son on the 1st of November and Ronald then failed to meet him on the 4th of November, as they had planned. After the passing of a couple of weeks without hearing from Ronald, he telephoned the credit union with which he banked and learned that his pension had not been drawn. Cecil immediately rang Wagga Wagga Police Station and reported him missing on the 24th of November, 1998. Later that day, Detective Sergeant Spence and another officer went to Ronald's Joy's Place flat to knock on his door and see if he was home. The next day, they returned to the block of flats and spoke with Matthew, who was having a cigarette outside his flat. While inside Matthew's flat, they noticed a collection of true crime books. Matthew said that he loved true crime, and he hoped someone would write a book about him one day. Matthew also said that he'd last seen Mr Galvin on the evening of Melbourne Cup Day, sitting on the stairway with a number of people, including someone he described as a bloke he'd never seen before. On the 30th of November 1998, Elaine de Jong received a telephone call from Matthew at 3am. He said that he needed to talk to her and asked if she would stand by him no matter what. He hung up shortly thereafter. After two minutes, he rang back and he repeated his request that she promised to stand by him. He went on to say that he was going to be away for a long time, about 16 years. He asked if Elaine would visit him and if she promised not to die before Matthew got out. Matthew then told Elaine that he killed that bloke that's missing from next door. Elaine asked where the body was and Matthew replied that it was somewhere in Urine Quinty. He then asked her not to tell anybody yet, and he told her that he wanted to do it in his own time. He then said he loved Elaine before hanging up. Elaine immediately spoke with her husband, and together they went to the Wagga Wagga police station and spoke with Sergeant Hogno at about 4am. At 9.30am, Matthew again telephoned Elaine, and he told her that he was in Sydney. He repeated his request for her to stand by him. In that conversation, he went on to tell Elaine that he killed a lady in Phillip Avenue as well on Caulfield Cup Day. Elaine asked him how, and Matthew told her that it was in the bath, but he didn't think anybody found her because he didn't think there was anything in the newspapers about it. He asked Elaine not to have the police waiting for him when he returned to Wagga Wagga. 
He said he wanted to go to the police station when it was daytime. Elaine told him, Matthew, don't come back here thinking that you can talk me into being quiet. You know how I am. Matthew said that he didn't know if he could do it and asked her to make him a tentative booking under the name of Matthew Brown on the coach from Sydney. Matthew did not take the coach. At 2.05pm, he telephoned Elaine again from Sydney. She was, at that time, speaking with Detective Sergeant Spence. During this conversation, Matthew told Elaine that he had some heroin and he thought it was best to end it all then. It appears that Matthew took an overdose of heroin sometime later that evening. Inspector Axford attended the Embarkation Park in Victoria Street, Potts Point, at a little after midnight on Tuesday the 1st of December 1998 to investigate a report of a male person who had apparently overdosed. He located Matthew lying unconscious in the park. The ambulance service was contacted and Matthew was revived by the administration of oxygen and Narcan. He was taken to St Vincent's Hospital for further treatment. After Inspector Axford got Matthew's name and details, he looked him up on the police computer system. And as a result of those inquiries, he arranged for Senior Constable Clark to attend at St Vincent's Hospital to arrest Matthew James Harris. Later that day, Robert Simpkin discovered a body between 6 to 8 metres off Church Plains Road in Urinquinty. He returned home and notified police, and later he accompanied an ambulance crew to the location of the body. Detective Senior Constable Scott Coleman attended the scene and recovered a number of documents from the body that carried the name of Ronald Edward Galvin. Pathologist Paul Bottrell conducted an autopsy on Ronald's body on the 8th of December 1998 and stated that the direct cause of death was consistent with strangulation. After Matthew's admissions to Elaine de Jong, Paul Botterill also re-examined the body of Yvonne Ford and found evidence of strangulation. Matthew was interviewed briefly on the 1st and the 2nd of December, but his answers were confusing and erratic, uh, probably due to the overdose that he'd had. During these interviews, Matthew was told of the admissions made by him to Elaine as to the killing of Ronald Galvin and Yvonne Ford. He said that he didn't remember having said these things to her. Nonetheless, he freely confessed that he was the killer. The final interview, conducted on the 1st of December, concerned the death of Peter Wannabom. Matthew had not made any admission to Elaine de Jong as to the killing of her brother. At the beginning of the interview, Matthew started to say that he did not know about the death of Mr Wannabom, and at that point he appeared to become upset. He expressed concern about upsetting Elaine de Jong, and went on to say that he might have something to do with it. Shortly thereafter, he clarified this by saying that he had strangled Mr Wannabom. He also admitted to the early robbery of Trang Nguyen and told the police the name of his accomplice, Ken Frazier. Frazier was later found guilty at trial and sentenced to a term of imprisonment of 54 months, comprising a minimum term of 39 months and an additional term of 15 months. There are emotional scenes at the Wagga local court on the 7th of December 1998 as Matthew appeared in the dock. A relative of Ronald Galvin drew his finger across his throat in a grim warning to the 30-year-old accused man, and police officers were strategically positioned about the packed courtroom in the event of trouble. Serial murder had come to Wagga, and the locals didn't like it, not one bit. Matthew, dressed in a white shirt and dark pants, sat quietly while Elaine de Jong tried to catch his eye as she mouthed the words, I love you, to him. But Matthew's head was down, and he only looked up when the police prosecutor told the magistrate that he admitted to the three murders. Later that day, Detective Sergeant Spence conducted a walk-around interview with Matthew at Yvonne Ford's home in Phillip Avenue. During the course of that interview, Matthew admitted that he had made a pretense of a sexual advance towards Ms Ford prior to killing her, and that he had suggested that they have a bath together. He said that he just wanted her to get in the bath so he could strangle her. He said that she rejected his feigned sexual advances, but disclosed that he was in the bath with her at the time when he strangled her. He admitted to having taken advantage of her intellectual disability. He also admitted having held her under the water while strangling her. According to him, it took three to four minutes to kill her. Also on the 7th December, Matthew participated in another walk-around interview at Ronald Galvin's flat. That interview was again conducted by Detective Sergeant Spence. Matthew found it difficult to recall the detail of the killing, but suggested that there had been no ulterior motive. To the best of his recollection, Mr. Galvin had invited him in when he went to his flat and asked for a beer or a cigarette. Once inside, he stood behind Mr. Galvin and strangled him. His only explanation for the killing was just a lot of anger. He was getting rid of the anger and it was being projected onto Ronald Galvin. He said that having got away with the earlier murders, he thought, well, why not go again? He repeated this more than once. He agreed that he used Elaine's car the following evening to move the body to the place where it was ultimately found. 
Two psychologists, Ms. Mazzio and Ms. Barrier, examined Matthew and prepared reports. Both came to broadly consistent conclusions. Ms. Barrier's testing revealed a schizotypal personality disorder or an avoidant personality disorder with prominent depressive schizoid traits. She stated that Matthew demonstrated little empathy for the victims and had only a little understanding of the enormity of his behaviour. Ms. Matsuo concluded that Matthew had a schizoid personality disorder. She said that he'd begun the difficult task of understanding himself and noted that Matthew was cognizant of his psychological shortcomings and his lengthy problems with drugs and alcohol. She said that he'd already shown himself to be highly motivated to work on his offending issues with psychological programs and his substance abuse issues with counsellors. She continued, Taken in context based on his day-to-day behaviour, Mr. Harris displays few pervasively antisocial traits. He does prefer to be alone rather than in large groups, but this stems from his feeling of inadequacy and worthlessness. He often denigrates himself and has a low self-image. Mr. Harris's history does indicate that he's often failed to comply with social norms, especially in terms of his drug use, prostitution and his criminal history. However, he does not lack remorse altogether. He has demonstrated significant levels of compassion both in and out of jail, helping others in need, and in particular taking care of young children at his home in Wagga. She continued that Mr. Harris's transient disregard for others has occurred at a very specific end and to a certain set of psychological circumstances. He believes the reason he felt indifference to the human life that he destroyed may be the indifference he feels towards his own existence. He is not, in terms of his enduring personality types, uh, an irritable, aggressive or violent person, and he's not a person who pervasively shows indifference or contempt for the feelings and suffering of others, or explosive anger. Somewhat disturbingly, she noted that he had expressed genuine remorse in relation to the death of Yvonne Ford, but not in relation to the two other victims. He had, however, expressed distress and confusion as to why this was so. On the 3rd of December 1999, Harris pleaded guilty to the murders and the robbery of Trang Nguyen. A chilled hush fell over the court as he explained his reasons for strangling his helpless victims. To me, I think of it as an achievement because I have achieved absolutely nothing in my lifetime. And to murder, and to keep murdering, and to get away with it, it was an achievement. But at the point of killing these people, I didn't care. I just thought I'd keep going and going, and obviously I was going to get caught, and I was caught, but if I hadn't, I would have just kept going. On the 7th of April 2000, New South Wales Supreme Court Justice Virginia Bell sentenced Harris to three concurrent terms of 40 years imprisonment with non-parole periods of 25 years in relation to the murders and three years imprisonment in relation to the robbery, making him eligible for parole on the 30th of November 2023. She declined to sentence him to life imprisonment without parole due to his confessions and guilty pleas and the psychiatric evaluations presented to the court. But the locals were not happy with the judge's decision. It worked out at only 8.3 years for a human life, and many thought that wasn't enough. Along with the families of the victims, citizens of Wagga campaigned long and hard to have Justice Bell's sentence overthrown and a longer sentence imposed. They wanted the maximum, life without parole. On the 2nd of May 2000, the matter was mentioned in the New South Wales Parliament, where it was noted that Harris had said he'd still be going if he wasn't caught. The Parliament agreed that the sentences were far too lenient. Bowing to strong public opinion, the Director of Public Prosecutions appealed against the murder sentences on the basis that they were inadequate. On the 20th of December 2000, the New South Wales Court of Criminal Appeal upheld the appeal and quashed Harris's sentences in relation to the murders of Ford and Galvin, substituting them with life sentences without parole, with the Chief Justice stating that it was the responsible thing to do for the court to intervene. Throughout the entire process, and despite the killing of her brother, Elaine de Jong continued to offer support to Matthew, and so did her daughter Jane. In a letter to the court, Elaine spoke of the prisoner's apparent caring relationship with a young child, then being looked after by Elaine and Jane, and his work with the Community Transport Service. Elaine de Jong passed away in Tweed Heads on the 22nd of March 2021, following complications from COVID-19. She was 82 years old. Matthew James Harris is currently being held at the Goulburn Correctional Centre, a super-maximum security prison. He picked his victims specifically. They all were unlikely to strike back and, in the cases of Peter Wenenbaum and Yvonne Ford, were particularly disabled, a fact that Matthew took complete advantage of when ending their lives. They were easy prey for this brazen killer. Thanks for your time today, I really appreciate you watching the whole video. Join me next time as we trawl through another episode in the true crime history of Australia. 
If you've enjoyed this video, once again, please go ahead and shoot the like button with your trusty boomstick and stab that subscribe button until it bleeds. Make sure you also punch the notification bell in the face so you get notified every time we release a new video. And remember, all of our episodes are released at the same time on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm also on Instagram, at Something About Murder, and I respond to every message I receive. So I look forward to hearing from you, and I hope you don't get murdered. Stay safe out there. Bye.